Okay. <clears throat> Hopefully this isn't going to be too difficult to see. Uh, we're talking about pedigrees, pedigree research. Hi, it's me. Your good old friend, Carol Hawk, otherwise known as Carol Eeks Hawkins. Carol Hawkins. Um, this is a nine generation pedigree of Starhaven's Mon Sauvage. <clears throat> when you look at the, the picture, it gives you a percentage rate of inbreeding, which is 67% according to their statistical analysis. Statistical analysis on a pedigree is not genetic. It carries no genetic information. So the only value that statistic holds is whether the information in the pedigree was correct as provided by the breeders. <clears throat> if the breeders did some hokey pokey stuff, that statistical analysis could vary by a percentage on either side. Okay, so there's nothing genetic about that. So when you're doing pedigree research, that inbreeding analysis is not genetic. It's a statistical percentage based on the pedigree. If you're using that to calculate genetic factors, you have no clue what you're doing. All right? So, <clears throat> and uh, a lot of you are French Bulldog breeders. <clears throat> that have probably less than 20 years in this breed. Some of you are going to have 40 or more years. Some of you will have, God willing, there will be some of you left that have 40 or 50 years worth of, you know, you have been in this breed 40 or 50 years. The average person, someone like myself, Patty Souza, the group of people we came in with probably have 30 to 35 years in this breed. Uh, early toy. Probably 30, 35 years in this breed. So, um, why did I pull up these two pedigrees? Because I made a statement on Facebook that Mar Mon or Starhaven's Mon Sauvage, Mon Sauvage is behind virtually every top winning dog and bloodline in the world, worldwide at this point. Um, and there was a statement made that no, that's not statistically true. Charlie Brown is behind all of the dogs worldwide. He probably is by this point in time. Uh, but in order to prove my point, you have to actually see what I'm trying to go, what I'm going to try and show you. Um, another breeder made a statement that their, the imports never had any impact, any real significant impact on this breed. So prepare, get your bowl of popcorn out, get something to drink, because I'm going to now show you, <laughs> pedigree-wise, that all of those statements that I made were absolutely true, and that if you have not done genuine pedigree research, you will not even have a clue as to what's behind Charlie Brown. You know, you look at the first three, four generations on your pedigree and you go, yep, that was it. That's all I need to know. That's because you're half asleep. You didn't do the other half. Think of the first three generations as the tip of the iceberg when you look at a pedigree. Until you go back seven to nine, you haven't begun to uncover the pedigree. Number two, to do pedigree research properly, you need to know the dogs. You need to see them. You need to talk to the breeders. You need to get first-hand information. Most of the second and third-hand information that's supplied by other breeders are usually competitors that didn't like losing to those people's dogs. All right. So, if you want to be, a, if you want to do real pedigree analysis, you want to be a smart person. Number one, try and find as much genuine information as you can on the the dogs in the pedigree behind your dog back, a minimum of seven, but preferably nine generations. And then take the dogs that are behind them that were prepotent back seven and nine generations so you actually know what you're talking about. Okay? Because otherwise you're going to look like a, a complete idiot when you talk about pedigree research. 
You know, if the only thing you've ever looked at is that little piece of paper in front of your face that the breeder supplied, at this point I actually want to sit down in my chair, put my feet up and go, whatever, just be stupid, I don't care. But since I've been doing pedigree research since I was 16 years old, I want to tell you how to do it. And my grandma taught me how to do it. She raised cows, purebred cows. All right, so you find your magazines, you find your historical research, you go back and look at the dogs in the pictures. You try to find first-hand accounts of them in the historical literature. First-hand accounts. All right, that would not, that would, in, that might include judges' interpretations of those dogs, but it should include first-hand information. All right, they're all dead. Who would have first-hand information on a dog 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago? Someone who saw the dog. Someone who judged the dog. Someone who bred to the dog. But preferably someone who saw the dog or talked to the breeder. So I spent hundreds of hours talking to breeders, finding out about their dogs. What they believed. What their concept of this, this breed was. What their ideas were about it. How the dogs were. Soundness, function, personality. I tried to get them to give me... Uh, information as much as I could in terms of problems with the bloodlines. Did they volunteer that information? 90% of the time, no. Did they share it? 10% of the time, yes. Because the reason being was at the time <clears throat> there was sort of a general consensus that to talk about this openly was to admit there's something wrong with your dog or your bloodline and that would cause some sort of, you know, fervor in the breed. And, and one breeder told me this way. She goes, you know, you have the ammunition, but why go load your, your enemy's cannons for them? Well, I didn't see it that way. I saw it this way. We have a problem. It exists in our breed. It affects all of us. It's not just a problem in my dog. It isn't a problem just in your dog. It's a problem in the entire breed. So the more information we can share it and share about it, the more likely we are not to just point fingers at each other. What's the point in that? There's no good in that. We're not there just to point fingers at each other and each other's eyes. We are there as a family. And these are like our, okay, if you want to say it, these are our children. We're trying to find a wholesome consensus that will allow us to breed better dogs, healthier dogs. We need a consensus. We have a breed standard. We got a blueprint. Now we need a consensus. So if you want to start doing pedigree research, go look at all of the dogs you can that are currently in the breeding pool. The top winning dogs, the top kennels. Talk to the old people. Talk to the old breeders. They are an invaluable source of information. They can give you information about dogs in your pedigree four, five, six, seven generations ago that will help you be a better breeder now, right now. So let's look at the pedigree. Let's look at the pedigree of Mon Sauvage. I've brought it back nine generations for you just for the sheer fun of it. Will he make it? Enstrom's will he make it? Enstrom, Spike of State, Starhaven. Who was Enstrom? Judy Enstrom. Judy Enstrom did, uh, she was a, a breeder, owner, handler. She was very successful. Um, she used a lot of imports. And she also used a lot of American breeding. And she tied them together in a very powerful way. I am not going to try and attempt to judge what people did. Whether they bred too many dogs, whether they didn't do enough health testing, whatever you want to call it. There's no point in judging how people did things, but there is a point in learning from what they did and how they did it. Okay? So you'll notice in this picture, <clears throat> in this dog, we're down to the, it looks like the dam side of the pedigree here, I think. We're almost halfway to there. We're just getting close to it. You'll notice a dog here, and I'm outlining it for you. Scobie's Maurice Bonamy. 
The man showing it is Herschel Cox. Are you awake? Because this would be a good time to wake up. This is Herschel Cox because this was his dog. He bought this dog. Okay. So what would that mean? That would mean this dog was a foundational breeding dog for Cox's good time French Bulldogs. Are you awake? Don't choke on your popcorn, okay? Eat it slow. Now, a lot of these dogs you're looking at be, are behind the Enstrom dogs. You're going to find out that Judy Enstrom imported or used import dogs. She used some Winmarks dogs. You know Winmarks? Winmarks has a sort of a shifty reputation in French Bulldogs. I'm not going to get into that. It's not important to me. But they imported some really well-bred dogs. They imported some really well-bred Tommyville dogs. And Tommyville is behind the Cox breeding stock. They were imports. In fact, imports have been used. How do you think French Bulldogs got to America? Do you think they grew on a tree and sprouted? Okay, maybe they did, a pedigree tree. They came from Europe and England. That's where they came from. They didn't grow on trees here. They were imported. So imports have been used from the very beginning. And a lot of that breeding stock was then exported back to Europe, the UK. <clears throat> it was shared. This was a shared breed. <clears throat> so it came to America. And people, the people that were trying to create a consensus within the breed, America had a very powerful impact on how this breed was going to be finally uh, blueprinted. They took the frame of the blueprint from England <clears throat> and they alternated it and said, we're not going to allow the blueprint you have in Europe and England because you, have, you don't have a size limit, number one. Number two, you allow multiple types of ears. We're not going to allow that. We want one ear type, and it's going to be the bad ear, which has become one of the primary characteristics of the French Bulldog, and it's born tailless naturally. That is because of that. You know, <clears throat> you can call it one of two types. It's, it's either a shortened tail or it is a, it is a hemivertebrae tail, whichever way you want to look at it because you have two tail types. <clears throat> Originally you had the long, straight, short, naturally short tail, like the tail on a pig, and then you had the hemivertebrae tail, the screw tail. So <clears throat> when you look back here, you're going to see some dogs that are, <laughs> you know, they're going to be, they're just going to be powerfully line bred on English imports, and they're going to be powerfully like Major's Golden Nugget here, behind all of it, virtually all the cock stocks. <clears throat> Burlington Birdie of Bristy, he was an import. I'm going to show you a picture of him in a little while. Good old Birdie. Um, and you can go back in his pedigree and look it up, but Burlington Birdie, you're going to find out, goes back to Tourette's. Because here's what happens. In those days, people exchanged stock. They exchanged it because it all came from Europe to begin with. It came to America. It was it was altered. That stock was altered, and I, I you know beyond a, sh a shadow of doubt, it was altered by using other certain other types of breeds. They were brought in in America. Okay. There's no getting around that. <clears throat> and as for the chronology of it. The Bulldog, of course, came first. Before that, the, the White Terrier. The chronology as it goes down, the Bulldog, then was the French Bulldog was developed from the Bulldog. The Boston was developed from the French Bulldog. That's the actual chronology. It didn't go the other way. That all-American Boston came from the French Bulldog. It was developed from it, in part. So, Enstrom's Willie Make It was a very... Um, I saw him in person, actually. In Chicago, he was a beautiful dog. 
I think he won the uh, supported entry there after the national, if I remember right. Um, it was a beautiful dog, nice cream dog. You go back in his pedigree, what you're going to find, <coughs> Wolf and Wrinkles, J. Edgar. J. Edgar was also a winning dog. I think he was owner handle. I remember a young guy that showed him. I think his name was Jeff something. But um, I didn't see him in person. But what does he go back to? So J. Edgar went back to uh, Sablano out of Flip out of Hampton's breeding, which goes back to Tourette's Turbolon de Gamin. Here's Tourette's Chef de Uber Gamin. So you're going right back into the Hampton breeding, the Tourette breeding, it's all line bred. You see where the colors are the same? That's because the dogs are the same. This is some really strong line breeding here. They were trying to achieve, each, each of these bloodlines was trying to achieve a certain look, a certain type and so they would line and inbreed on those dogs. So when you look at this dog, you've got gamin here, gamin here, gamin here, gamin here, gamin here, gamin here, gamin here. Now do you understand why it's necessary to do pedigree research? Because if you just cut it off at these first three generations, you're not going to understand what they did. All right? You're not going to get it. So they took Jimmy Lee Sparkle, they bred to a dog that was out of another Tret dog, out of, guess what, an import from Baristi, Bullet of Baristi. She goes back to Cider Cup. These dogs, this, these were extremely well-known dogs in the UK, Cider Cup. These were, these were dogs that were top producers, top winners. They were well-known. They, they would have been, you know, <clears throat> The winners of that in in that country and then you go back and you find gum in gum in gum in again gum in so and then you're gonna f we come into the import birdie of bristy i think burlington birdie of bristy was what well, i believe he was imported by windmarks he was also very line bred but even when you look at him you've got <laughs> You've got all of this English breeding, and then again, as we talked about earlier, he went back to a Tourette's bitch. So they were exchanging bloodlines back and forth. There were Cox dogs in Europe. There were Cox dogs that were, they were exchanged bloodlines in Europe. Okay, so this happened commonly. This was not something new. We just got this real weird influx of European dogs in the past decade or so because of puppy milling and that was to bring in the you know the the DQ colors but this constant back and forth exchange of stock happened in all of the major bloodlines in America virtually all of them and it was essential it was an essential part of creating this breed so when you look back at these dogs um, you'll see the, the powerful uh, line breeding effects behind you know, of the Tommyville dogs, which were Maureen Boodle. <coughs> Maureen Boodle probably, in reputation, was at least equal to Herschel Cox. At least. So if you're going, ah, you know, who cares about that? You should. This is the breeding that's behind all of the top dogs from the 70s back in America, from the 70s back, it's the same basic breeding, exchange of bloodlines. So, you look at the Enstrom dogs, they're going to be very powerfully line bred, you know, like on Tweet Effect here. And they're going to also be very powerfully line bred on some American breeding. There's Tweet Effect again, Tweet Effect again. You know, now we're back to Tourette's. And Herschel's dog, one of his foundation stud dogs, Scobie's Maurice Bonamy. So, why do you look back? This is why. Here's Gammon again. These are, this is all Tourette's breeding. There's Scobie's Maurice Bonamy again. Now we have a Cox, direct Cox line here. Scobie's Maurice Bonamy brought in, he brought it to one of his bitches. Cox is good time to eat the fish. And then what you have here 
is some old cox breed that you're not going to recognize because you don't do pedigree research. You'll recognize the name Pierre. Oh, Pierre, yeah, I remember Pierre. But why don't you remember Scobie's and Maurice Bonamy, the dog that produced him? Why don't you re recognize that the bloodlines behind this dog were not Cox. Cox came out of this bloodline. It came out of these line breeds. You have Cox, Cox breeding. People who were back in that day knew Cox. That was an American bloodline, bred to Quat. Quat is an English bloodline. So you have Tourette's, and then you have Quat, and you have all of this combination of UK, American exchange bloodlines. So when you say, yeah, my dog was all pure Cox, what are you talking about? What, where, where, what are you talking about? Cox bloodline came from like all the other bloodlines, Hampton, Tourette, Windmarks, all of them. They all came from a combination of American bred dogs that were line bred, inbred, American stock from original imports that were then combined with imports brought in and exports sent out to the UK, to Europe, you know, like Chescott Eros, you know, back to Chase Home Souvenir, one of the top UK, beautiful UK dog, goes back to Bomblets, you know, Bomblets, Vivian Watkins, one of the top UK breeders of all time. She's like, she is as foundational as Tourette. Where could you not see this? I mean, how do you people miss this stuff? Have you never gone back into your pedigrees and looked beyond the first three generations? Seriously. This is UK breeding. This is all UK breeding. And then you come back and you find out it's intermixed with Hamptons, Tourette's. You know, it's all intermixed. Here's Jimmy Lee's Bandolero Vono. Now, why do I want you to remember that name? Jimmy Lee's. You know, Foster Hansen? Does anybody remember Jimmy Lee's? Was anybody around at the time? Because he was before my time. But Jimmy Lee's is behind every Cox dog. Why don't you know that? Okay, Tourette's. Smith's Bone Maw. Smith's. Smith's French French. Does anybody not know who the Smith's French Bulldogs were? Okay, think about that. What did they do? Who were they? What dogs came out of their breeding? So, it's like Abe and Susie Siegel. How many people remember Taurus Joe? They didn't do a lot of breeding. Smiths, they, were, they did not do a ton of breeding. But what they did was very powerful line breeding. And so the dogs they produced had a very powerful, prolific effect on the breed. They didn't have to do a lot of breeding. They did a lot of powerful line breeding. Here's Gamin again. Who does Gamin go back to? Tourette's Chef Diover. Who goes back to? Tourette's Chef Diover. This is Gamin and this is over. You can pronounce it however you want. I'm not French. Goes back to Phoebe's Menjou too. How many of you ever heard of that dog? 1942. You're like, well, where did that one come from? Click the button and get the pedigree and look. You know, Tourette's Turbulon Arash. Did any of you ever go to one of the national specialty seminars where Jen Hampton did a historical on the breed and she'd bring up the great dogs, the great powerful influencers of the past? Well, these two dogs were the pride of her presentation. Turbulon Arash. Tourette's turbulent them in. If you were there, you heard it. And she would speak with this deep love and admiration for these dogs because she knew them personally. She saw them. So here's the pedigree of Mon Sauvage. You've got some Coke breeding in here. Chase home, you go back to the English again. It's a constant repetition basically of the same dogs being used in very 
in-depth line breeding. You'll have you'll have one or two that go out to bomblets. You'll have one or two that go out to something you may not recognize. But just take it, pick, you know, hit the button and go back and look and see what's behind that dog. Here is a German line, Radebor and Kovi. That's a German line. You know, and any and of course Della Peru would have been the person or the people to talk to about Radebor and Kovi, and they did. They did articles about them. Their foundational lines came from that kennel in particular. So and then you go right back into the Tourette's, the Smiths, the Tourette's. And uh, you end up back where you started. This is just a powerful group of line bred dogs. They all, the front part of the generation, the first four or five forward, they're going to have some different names. But in the end run, they're going to be the same dogs. Now, the reason I'm doing this was because I have to make this point for you. When you tell me that this dog or this dog had a more powerful effect, basically what you're telling me is one dog had a lot more bitches bred to it than the other because the genetic prepotency of the dogs were equal. Their effects on the breed were almost equal. Because sometimes what will happen is that you get one offspring out of a prepotent dog, like Charlie Brown here. You'll get one offspring out of that dog. Maybe Mon Sauvage, maybe I'll be great, maybe, you know, uh, creme de la creme. Pick your dog. You get one offspring that is a top winner or becomes a very powerful uh, influence on the breed. And so that bloodline becomes ingrained in that breed because of it. Was Charlie Brown a greater producer than Mon Sauvage or I'll Be Great? Probably not. But he had far more access to bitches that were being bred. Okay? So, let's just say that these people, Herschel himself being extremely you know, breeding a lot of dogs, just because he bred a lot of dogs, is going to have a lot more influence, period, than someone who bred, say Herschel bred 1,500 French Bulldogs in his lifetime. Let's just make that a guess number. Someone who bred 50 would not have as much widespread influence on the breed. Okay, so let's look at Charlie's pedigree because this is where it gets real for you. For you people that go, those imports never had any effect on the French Bulldog breed. You're living in a dream world because you've never done any real pedigree research in your entire life. You looked at your pedigree three generations, four generations, and you went, there it is. You never did the work. You never talked to the breeders. You never went back in time. You never did any historical research. So all you got was what you knew about the dogs that came out of the breedings you did. That is if you followed them. All right, so look at, let's look at Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown was sired by Ace in the Hole. Same dog that sired my original bitch, Cox's Good Time Allspice. That was her father. Charlie Brown's mother. Let's see if I can find her. Boom, 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 boom. Let's keep going. Cox's Good Time Mindy Lou of k &D. Now, if you want to do pedigree research on Cox and you actually want to understand where the powerful genetic prepotency came from in this bloodline. There were a number of good stud dogs that Herschel went to. There were a number of very powerful stud dogs. But his genetic prepotency came from primarily one bitch, Mademoiselle Eve, which he did not breed. 
but she was a powerfully prolific producer. I think she's still the all-time top producing bitch French Bulldog. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not a statistician. I don't work with the club, and I don't do those numbers. But powerfully prolific bitch, Mademoiselle Eve. And that is, you're looking at, this is the success behind the Cox Dogs right here. Mademoiselle Eve. That's it. You want to know where the genetic prepotency came from? I can tell you a few others, but I'm not going to right now because I want you to learn something. And if you don't learn something here, it's because you aren't trying. You just aren't trying. So let's look at, at Charlie Brown's pedigree. That's all American breeding, right? It's all American. It's bred by Herschel Cox. It's all American. That's what you just got done telling me. Out of Adam's unique physique. Adam's unique physique was the sire of Ace in the Hole. Unique physique himself was a prolific producer as well as a winner. Uh, you will find him at, at, at least, probably, if not more, prolific behind the actual foundation of this breed as Charlie Brown himself in terms of effect on the, the breeding programs. Go look at Colette's breeding program. Uh, go look at uh, Jaguar. Look at, look at Carbone. Look at Carboni's. Go look at his. Go look at his background, his uh, pedigrees, and see what you find. Okay, he came out of Smith's P Petty Mater, out of Smith breeding, Smith's Bone Mall. What do you see in here? Mm. It's exactly the same breeding that's behind Mon Sauvage. Wow, how crazy is that, right? It's crazy. There's Turbalon, Chef Digamin, Coke's Bloodline, Quat. Quat was one of the most prolific in terms of numbers, let's just say and influence. Quat was a very early English breeder that that probably is as influential on the UK background of French Bulldogs as Cop America. And originally Quat was was done very well. It was it was a bloodline that was done very well. After the original breeder died, it went into the hands of lesser individuals and became promoted in a in a wrong way. But those quat dogs made a profound influence on all of the dogs in the UK, just like Cox did in America. So when you find that, here you've got another Bristy dog, Ben Hooks, Chase Home Souvenir, <laughs> Tourette's Turbulence, the same thing. It's the cross between these same dogs, just done in different ways. Tourette's, Tourette's, Turbulon Digamin, Chef Digamin. You know, it's the same exact thing, Smith's Bon Mot. And then Tourette's, it's a combination, it's the same combination of dogs. Why don't you just take the two pedigrees and lay them over each other? and count how many of the dogs are exactly the same, just in a different order. You want to really embarrass yourself? Go do that, because that'll be fun for you. <laughs> Jimmy Lee's Flip. Remember we talked about Jimmy Lee's. Hampton Chevalier, same dogs, Gem in. Jimmy Lee's Bandolero, same dog that features behind Mon Sauvage. Take two pedigrees, flip them. Put them all the top of each other. All you got to do is mix the dogs around. You have the same basic dogs. So what am I trying to tell you here? You've never researched a pedigree in your life if you haven't done this. All you have done is look at the upfront dogs and gone, I'm done. I know it all now. When you're not even close. You're not even close. So, since I've already proven this to you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the pictures are in front of your face, 
The names are in front of your face. There's Scobies and Maurice Bonamy, Herschel Cox. You have it in front of you, all of the evidence you need to prove exactly what I told you. And here's Bonamy again. This was a, looks like a very, very, very tight line braiding, which was behind Gidget. Is this where potentially the, uh, the VWD ratings came from? Probably. The tighter in you breathe, the more you bring out the genetic issues. It's just a fact. You want to you wanna know what you have in your bloodline? We figured this out 40 years ago. The quickest way to find out what you got is to, to breed, do a breeding on the, the, the bloodlines that you have. The stud dog that you brought in, breed a bitch back to her father. Breed the mother back to her son. Now you're going to find out what you got. And if you want to know everything back there, you take a puppy from that and breed it back in. And now you're going to find out everything that you've got in that bloodline. That's how they did it in the old days. That's how they separated the good from the bad. They inbred. They found out what the problems were, and then they knew where to steer away from them. But I don't like that. That's, that's sick. Well, everything you've got back in these pedigrees is going to be inbred and linebred. Every single thing. And that's not just going to be U.S. You're going to find that U.K., Europe, worldwide. Because that's how breeders did it before they had the opportunity to do genetic testing. It was done that way. Turbolano Raj, Gamin. I don't know how I could state this case any better than I have. Because the only difference is the names out of the dogs that came out of this breeding. They're exactly the same dogs, radar ahead. You know, look, it's right here in front of you, Cokes. It's right here in front of your face, Radabor and Kobe, the German lines. Chase Home Ricky, the UK lines. You know, and then back, Bandolero of Ono again. Same thing. Heart to beat. Where do you think this stuff came from? It grew on a tree? I mean, these people did exactly what I'm telling you. They line and inbred, line and inbred. They exported and imported. They would even import back their own bloodlines crossed with the, the, the national bloodline that they were working with, the international bloodline they were working with. Scobie's Maurice Bonamy. So, all you're going to see here is Mon Sauvage's pedigree and tightened up, tightened up by, by actually compounding it more and more and more. The same dogs compounded upon each other by line breeding and inbreeding over and over and over. And if that sickens you, then you, you, you're not going to like your breed very much because this is how it's done in every breed. Ben Hook Cider Cup, we're back to the UK dogs. Radabor and Kobe, Hampton Chevalier, Turbalon Digam and Turbalon Digam. Just look at the colors so you can see which ones are which. There's Bandolero Bono again. So Chevalier, it's the same pedigree as Mon Sauvage. You just put the dogs in a different order. And instead of this coming out Cox from the, f the fifth generation forward, it comes out Starhaven. Or it could come out Band Dog. Or in some cases, it could come out Sunlit, Jaguar. Because the part you're looking at is the part where other names were put on the same breeding. Okay, so I've just proven to you that Charlie Brown's pedigree is at minimum one half foreign breeding, at minimum one half foreign breeding, just like Mon Sauvage, just like all the rest of them. It's half UK, part German, but that's what it is. You're not going to get away from that because that's the reality. So when you do pedigree research, Always start by going back a minimum of seven generations. 
minimum seven generations and pray to God that you actually get a bitch as good as Mademoiselle Eve <laughs> because if you did you would have got a incredibly prolific producer and if you look on this list if it's big enough for you to read you see the foundation of virtually half of the modern bloodlines. Let's just go here. Her sibling, Sourdough Smoke and Joe Magoo. Sourdough. Was that Miller? Were they the people from Alaska? I'm trying to remember. But look, isn't this interesting? Look what's under here. Doro, Bondi Shvantishova. That was a dog out of Mademoiselle Eve, who was one of her offspring. Did it go to Holland? It went somewhere in Europe, right? Or it came from somewhere in Europe, and more likely it came from somewhere in Europe. Cox is good time cricket. Cricket was the dam of my bitch, Allspice which is why Allspice was a prepotent producer because she was directly line bred to this prepotent bitch just like all of your dogs were. All of your Cox bred dogs were. Candy's Kennel. So all of you people, all of you former board members of the club, all of you former breeders, you know, dancing around in your gold shoes, whatever you're doing today, band dog, all of you, every single one of you, including James Dalton, including all the rest of you, your kennels are built on the foundations of other people. It was their million dollar investment in their lifetime that got you where you are today. Now, the one thing I knew growing up was that nobody, no man is an island, and no breeder is an island unto themselves. Everything that you become, everything that you're able to do is built on the backs and hard work, love, tears, and investment of somebody else. Maybe a lot of somebody else's, but you never got there by yourself. And so when I wrote the article about bloodlines and mentoring in America, it was about you people. The you people. Who are you people? You're not we the people. You're the people of the entitled generation who believed that your success was entirely your own. And you never named. You never stood with the people who got you there. You just said, we are the greatest. We bred these 100 champions. We won the national 10 times. We had the first Westminster group winner. We, you know who we includes? Every single breeder that supplied you breeding stock. Your brilliant decisions in breeding was a roll of the dice. And you know it as well as I do, because I've done this a long, long time. So, I've just proven to you a number of things. I have given you a way to do pedigree research if you want to actually use your brain and do it. But again, you know, this abandonment of the past, this entire overlooking of the generational uh, factors involved of the historical information and research that was always traditionally done, it begins with you your commitment to know what is in your pedigree, your commitment to talk to breeders and be mentored by them, instead of just going, yeah, whatever, let them go off to the nursing homes where they belong, they, they can't walk around a ring anyway, your unwillingness to have your dogs evaluated by the real experts that still exist in this breed. And real experts are people who have an eye for a dog it's born. It's, it's not something that you develop. Generally speaking, you're born with it. Some people have it. Some people aren't born with it. 
And that's why you have very successful breeders and sometimes you just have very successful exhibitors of other people's breeding. Nothing wrong with that. Some people are born painters, some writers, some electricians, you know, whatever they're born, wherever their talent is. But your kennel, your success, and your value today is entirely dependent on your ability to take yourself down three or four steps, be humble, and actually give credit where credit's due. Now I've just given you a free seminar on how to do pedigree research. That's not going to give you an eye for a dog. It's not going to give you a concept of the original standard or how the standard writers intended it to be. For that, you're going to have to do the historical research yourself. Look at that original standard. You know, there are volumes of this information that supposedly the club has, Arley had. Where'd they go? Why aren't they being reproduced? Why wasn't the blue book reproduced and given to every reader? Because you stamped your own idea of what the breed should look like over the top of the people who created the breed. And you changed the breed. To, you know what? You, you changed the breed. You altered it conceptually from its original blueprint. I was there when they did that, that rewrite of the standard, and Janice Hampton was furious. I still have the letters. I'll show them to you if you want to see them. She was there with the original group of people. So she had a pretty, pretty good concept of what this breed was supposed to be like. You never change the standard to fit the dog. You fit the dog into the standard. <laughs> you can go, hey, those people 200 years ago, 150 years, they didn't know what they were doing. They had no concept of genetics. Let me tell you what. They produced better dogs than most of you produce today. They were healthier, sounder, they could breathe, they had tails. With all of your expert medical, anatomical, genetic research information, you are no better off. You aren't. It hasn't helped you significantly. Really, it hasn't. Because if you couldn't tell a sound dog in moving, in its construction, in its breathing, longevity and health, if you couldn't tell that without testing, you're like a doctor that's dependent on medical tests to make a diagnosis. These people did the diagnosis through real life. They were horsemen. They were living with animals. They knew how to read them, understand them. I could tell you, <laughs> not that it would matter to any of you, I could tell you by looking at how a dog moves what's wrong with it. <laughs> Generally speaking, I'm right. I can go into my veterinarian and tell my veterinarian what's wrong with my dog. So, and yes, I come from a farming background. And yes, I come from, my family has a lot of ties with the horse world. So, yeah, we had some horse sense to begin with. It's not bragging. It's a fact. I could still judge dogs as well as anyone out there in America. And definitely at least equal to the people that you have judging right now. Not only that, I could write a full analysis of your dog. Faults and virtues based on the standard. And I did it because I judged for other things than AKC where the only thing that matters is the ribbon and who you know. Okay? When you want someone who really knows about dogs, that can tell you from the ground up where they came from, how they should look, why they are the way they are, and what has happened in this breed, watching over a 40-year period. What has happened in this breed? I'll tell you why. I could probably tell you why. I bet you even Patty could tell you why, if she'd tell you. That's because of how you have changed the standard, and you've changed the original picture of this dog. Compact never meant the dog was square. Do any of you get that? Compact never meant the dog was cobby or square. 
So shortening the back of the dog by removing the loin section and shortening the rib cage so it no longer covers the abdominal cavity is not just an it's, it's not just a, a genetically uh, flawed approach. It's an anatomical mistake, and it's a standard deviation from the breed concept. There's a lot of other stuff. We could talk about every part of the dog. We could talk about the head, why the muzzle should be square, why the front shouldn't be A-frame, why the legs should not be too short or too long. Why? Okay, we could go on forever on this. And maybe that's what this club needs to do, is actually go back to what the breed was supposed to be. Instead of redefining it every single year by the winning dog. I can promise you that was not how Herschel bred dogs. That was not how Janice Hampton bred dogs or the Tourette's or the Smiths or Taurus Trill. That's not how they bred dogs. Any time that you let the winning dog frame your concept of the breed standard, you are going to lose. The dogs are going to lose because you never let go of the blueprint for a ribbon. One last word I'm going to leave you here before I make you feel so angry that you actually want to, you know, take your popcorn bowl and flush it down the toilet or dump it over my head. Let me give you a piece of advice I was given when I was young. This comes from a very, very long time great, great breeder. You are always wiser to choose a dog with one obvious fault that's otherwise a great dog, a great dog with one obvious fault, one obvious flaw, than a mediocre dog with no obvious virtue. All right, that's my soapbox for the day. And I hope some of you French Bulldog readers actually, actually think about it.